uh, roots of unity. So I can write this uh, like this. This is the vector space V. V is direct sum. where omega to the i, where i and e are uh, co-prime, i less than or equal to e minus. See, I sort of take this part together, all the primitive eth roots of unity, so that space is actually defined over q, because I've uh, put, put all the conjugates together. So these spaces are defined over q. And uh, so this is the Hermitian form I'm talking about, h omega 1, omega 2. And so it uh, preserves this Hermitian form, so it goes into uh, this group. So let me just keep this, um, I have to rub something out. So, uh, so let me uh, sort of uh, change tack a little bit. Uh, there is a kind of criterion for thin uh, group which uh, can be read off from Delin Mostow, which I will give you first. So let's look at the the ring of integers z root two inside q root two. This has two real embeddings. a plus b root 2 goes to a plus b root 2 and a minus b root 2. So it has two real embeddings. And under this, z root 2 goes into a discrete subgroup here. Right? So <coughs> in, that also means that SL2 of z root 2 is embedded in SL2R cross SL2R as a discrete subgroup. You know? The matrix A plus B root 2 goes to A plus B root 2 here and A minus B root 2 here. That's the map. So it's a discrete subgroup. But in fact, one can show that this group is Zariski dense here in SL2 cross SL2. Now, suppose I have a subgroup gamma. Uh, here, which has finite index. You, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention this. Z root 2 is dense in each of these embeddings. Z root 2 is dense in R. Z root 2 is also dense in the other projection. So although the group is discrete in the product, in each of these projections, it's um, dense. But suppose I have a subgroup gamma here, which has finite index. Then again, for, uh, for this gamma, each of these projections is dense. That's easy to show. Hmm? So if you can get a subgroup gamma, which is Zariski dense in SL2, in the usual topology, in the, in the Hausdorff topology. You know, I'm just saying that Z root 2 is dense in R. That's more or less it. Yeah? But if I have a subgroup gamma such that the projection is discrete in one of these factors, but it is Zariski dense in SL2 cross SL2, then it's thin. If gamma as discrete projection, into one of these factors, then gamma is a thin subgroup. Right, it cannot have finite index because as soon as it has finite index, projection should be dense. <coughs> so, uh, so what they do is, in fact, get this uh, monodromy group as a subgroup of such a product. For example, one of these, and they show that the, one of the projections is in fact dense. 
So let me explain uh, what exactly the situation is. So as I said, there is a fixed Hermitian form which is sort of defined over Q uh, into which the monodromy group goes. No, no, there is a Hermitian form on the entire vector space, just restrict. Uh, the Hermitian form is restricted to the eigenspaces, that's it. So you are not doing that yet? I am not doing that yet, very nice, yeah, <laughs> right, indeed. So uh, what I do is I, I now take the part where the, uh, where I only concentrate on the primitive dth roots uh, of unity, those eigenspaces. So I take its image. And this in itself is a product for each divisor uh, d of e. But I'm going to take only this part. So this is often called the primitive part uh, of the monodromy action. Now you see this is a this is really the ring of integers in a dth cyclotomic extension. Zt by phi d of t is the ring of integers in the dth cyclotomic extension. Um, so this has many embeddings. One for each m, uh, one for each root of phi d of t. So, but I take only half of this because I'm in the unitary group. The bar is determined by this. So I take only half of this, um, z omega, excuse me. Only those which are co-prime, but uh, ignore the ones which are related by complex conjugation. So the embedding here is t goes to omega to the i for a fixed dth root of unity. So we have a monodromy group here, so to speak, the primitive part. Uh, which has projections here. But you see, the, uh, the signature of the Hermitian form can be different for each of these. So u, p, i, q, i. So this Hermitian form looks, uh, has different signatures. Sometimes it could be compact and sometimes uh, non-compact and so on. <clears throat> so uh, for uh, Actually, excuse me, I shouldn't have used the letter I, so let me just say S. More comfortable with this. So I'm going to, I'm going to concentrate on one of these eigenspaces, where the eigenvalue is omega to the S for a fixed dth root of unity. Uh, the operator T acts by omega to the S. So the eigen, uh, the signature is U, the P S comma Q S. <clears throat> so for these signatures, I'm going to define certain numbers, mu, uh, mu i. You see, let me recall the uh, setup. We started with a family of uh, cyclic covers of P1, which were given by certain equations like this. So I have these numbers, 1 to k1 to ki. 
So, mu i is k i times s divided by d. It is the fractional part. So, define So, all that we have done is uh, fix the eigenspace and with respect to this eigenspace, we have got these numbers between 0 and 1. So, I, I just bunch them together. So, the theorem of Dalin Mosto. says the following. So, suppose this mu infinity satisfies a certain inequality. If this, then u p s q s, that particular part, that particular eigenspace is just, ah, sorry, I should have mentioned this. The the dimension of the vector space on which this acts is usually n minus 1. This is an n minus 1 dimensional vector space, Hermitian space. Each of these eigen eigenspaces is n minus 1. Sometimes it drops a bit, but the eigenspaces here are, uh, are of dimension n minus 1. So, u n minus 2 comma 1. So, this is a uh, what uh, this is what is called a ball quotient. Yeah? Uh, there is one condition which they call the integrality condition. If I take this uh, numbers mu i and mu j and take this inverse, this is always an integer if mu i not equal to mu j and is half an integer mu i equal mu j. And this also holds for infinity. Right? So, these are called integrality conditions. Uh, by the way, uh, some people call it semi-stability condition. I do not know why. So, I will have to ask uh, this particular audience in fact. So, suppose this is satisfied, if this holds, then the projection of this gamma into u p s q s is discrete. So, it is a criterion for discreteness of projection. In fact, they show that for n greater than or equal to 3, uh, 4, sorry, uh, this is an if and only if condition. If and only if the integrality conditions are satisfied, uh, is this true that the projection is discrete? But uh, in general, I, I do not want to get into the proof. In general, so this would mean it is thin, this would mean it's thin uh, more or less. Well, uh, just a moment. Yeah. This would mean if it is thin, if you knew that all the other factors, if there is one more non-compact factor, if all the other factors were compact and only this guy is u n, uh, UN minus 2 comma 1, then it won't be thin. It's, in fact, it will be arithmetic. So, if there exists uh, some S prime not equal to S, S prime uh, D equal to 1, such that u p s prime q s prime is non compact, uh, then uh, gamma is thin. But in fact, much more is true. Well, that is actually that was the uh, that was what they were looking for. The, this is the main part of the theorem. The projection, if uh, if you also assume this condition. Uh, 3, assume, assume 3. Projection of gamma into u n minus 
2 comma 1 is a non arithmetic lattice. So, all you need to do to produce non arithmetic lattices is to produce numbers k i like this such that these are integral. Okay? But it turns out you cannot find too many of them. So, the only non arithmetic lattices you can get this way are in u 2 1 and u 3 1. Uh, how much time do I, do I have? Infinity, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do not want to delay you. <clears throat> so, so, in order that we should get a rank 1 factor, this is necessary. In fact, it is an if and only if condition. This is not, by the way, this part is not hard to prove, it is something simple. The real thing is the discreteness of projections and what is more that uh, the projection has finite covolume, it is a lattice. That is the important part. <coughs> uh, so, in order that we should get rank 1 factors, we must have such an inequality. If uh, real rank 1 unitary groups. Uh, perhaps uh, I can say this to some people here. The reason one is looking for real rank 1 is that if you had a higher rank here, you know, integers p and q, so that both p and q are greater than or equal to 2, then you will never get non-arithmetic lattices. They are all arithmetic by a famous theorem of Margulis. So, this is the only uh, time you can expect non-arithmetic lattice. <clears throat> so, if uh, real rank 1 unitary groups are to be involved, uh, then this mu infinity, this is one has to have such an equality, uh, inequality. But let me recall this, this is summation. So, 2 greater than or equal to summation k i s by d. There are n of this, each one of this is at least 1 by d, n by d. So, n less than or equal to 2 d. So, if I want to have real rank 1 groups, I must have this inequality. So, you can actually ask what would happen if uh, you know, if you took uh, the number of ramification points to be more than twice the degree. Hmm? So, theorem. If n greater than 2d, and yeah, this is somewhat sad. All the ki's are co prime uh, to d. Yeah, that's right. For some s, if uh, so if you have rank one, you want that condition on the unit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. For some s, there is some s for which this is true. This is true, but you see, this uh, this estimate is independent of s, one by d. Each one of these is one by d, so n by d is less than or equal to two. So you must have this. So if you if you don't get rank one factors at all, in fact, you do get arithmetic groups. Uh, so, the only new part that I am, the last time I already spoke about this, the only new part is uh, this is also true. If n greater than d, then gamma is arithmetic provided all k i are co prime. So, uh, in some sense, each one of these local ramifications is also d. Uh, ramification degree is d. So, I just want to sketch a proof of this, provided I do not trip over my shoelaces.
so uh, the uh, thing is to identify the base with a certain uh, the fundamental group of the base with a certain nice group and one should also identify the monodromy representation with something uh, with which one can compute so the uh, identification of the fundamental group uh, with a nice uh, finitely presented group is very classical so I, i'm going to sketch a proof in a very special case we are going to look only at this family f monic of degree n n greater than So uh, if I want to look at this fundamental group, the, so let me fix a base, base point. In other words, I'll fix this uh, one particular polynomial. Oh, yeah, yeah, distinct roots. F has distinct roots. Thanks. So I'll fix one such polynomial. Um, So I sort of picture it like this, one, two. those are the roots. So if I have a loop around this point, I have a, a one parameter family of polynomials with distinct roots. Uh, but uh, at zero it is F0 and at one also it is F0, that's the loop. So I can picture it like this. So the roots of this polynomial are also moving around because the polynomial is moving. But then uh, the roots move like this. The nth root might probably go to the second one and so on. So the fundamental group can be viewed as a collection of paths uh, from these endpoints to the other endpoints. So in other words, it's the braid group. Pi 1 of s, uh, that's the base space of polynomials of degree n uh, is the braid group on n letters. And there are some nice generators for this braid group. So where all the paths are just identity, except here there is an uh, there is an interchange. You know, they don't meet. It's in uh, three space. They come out of the blackboard. So let's call this particular loop SI. So the braid group is generated by these loops S1, S2, Sn minus 1. You know, it's o it only goes up to N minus 1 because the last one is N. So I have this. And the braid group has generators. Uh, this and it has the it has some nice relations. So if i and j are far apart, they commute, and if they are contiguous, this is called the braiding relation. So this is the fundamental group. <clears throat> uh, and one would like to understand what the monodromy representation is for this. That's also a fairly pleasant description, but it needs a little bit of notation. So I have this uh, space of polynomials f, and I get a fibration x prime where In other words, Z does not, uh, Z lies in the complement of the set of roots of F, which are distinct. Right? 
And this vibration has a continuous section because you know taking a polynomial I can assign to it uh, for example sum of absolute values of coefficients plus 1. So it has a continuous section. Right? So therefore the fundamental group of this is a semi direct product of the fundamental group of this with the fundamental group of the free group on n generators. Phi 1 of x prime is the free group on n generators times this. It has a continuous section you know just send f to f comma z where z is 1 plus sum of absolute values of coefficients of f. <coughs> so the action here is actually very nice. Uh, you can find suitable generators here uh, such that each si takes xj to xj if j is less than i or j greater than or equal to i plus 2 uh, si of xi it shifts it to the next So it looks like this. So it just uh, affects two of these excess. Um, yeah. So uh, we have this exact sequence fn, uh, I can take z as a coefficient of fn where all the xi's are sent to the same element. So each xi is sent to q. So I have a certain kernel. You see if you notice uh, the braid group uh, respects this exact sequence because each xi goes to q and so does this. And here it goes into a conjugate, therefore it also goes to Q. So it respects this exact sequence. So let's look at the homology of this. Okay. You see, on the homology of K, Fn operates by inner conjugation, but K of course acts trivially. Uh, so it, and so it's really a module over this. It's a ZQ to the Z module. You can show that it is in fact a free module of rank n minus 1. That is the n minus 1 that is coming from. So the, uh, the module is generated by some very simple elements namely xi, xi plus 1 inverse. If I look at this element, this goes to identity because each xi goes to q. So these elements lie in the kernel. And as a as a module over this, they generate freely generate. Uh, uh, abelianization, sorry, the abelianization. So if I look at if I go modulo this, I have still this exact sequence, and this is a free module of rank uh, so and so. <coughs> So the braid group acts, I have a homomorphism into GL n minus 1 of ZQ, Q inverse. I think I should have said it better. You know, in some sense, this action is the action of the universal cyclic cover uh, on this family. So uh, instead of fixing D, if I just vary D also. To infinity, it is the action on that uh, on the kernel. So that is this uh, braid group action. And in fact, uh, there is a Hermitian form about which I will not uh, speak because there is too much uh, there is too much notation involved. So there is a Hermitian form here. Uh, by Hermitian, I mean the following: this ring has an involution. Q goes to Q inverse, and uh, uh, there is a Hermitian form on this module which is preserved by the braid group, so it goes into this. 
So this representation is called the Burao representation. So I want to relate this Burao representation to monodromy. So uh, here is a lemma. So suppose a rho B n is a Burao representation, and I reduce, I evaluate at a primitive dth root of unity. So I get a specialization. And you see, this is a ring of integers in, uh, in the cyclotomic extension. So this is in GL n minus 1 C. So I get an n minus 1 dimensional representation by specializing this Bureau representation to the all the primitive dth roots of unity. <coughs> so this is denoted rho n of d. I, yes, the inclusion depends on the choice, but it doesn't matter. In the, all I'm saying is that this representation is usually absolutely irreducible. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, it depends on the choice. So, uh, if d does not divide n, rho n d is absolutely irreducible. If d does divide n, then rho and d contains a trivial representation, uh, one-dimensional, and the quotient, which I denote rho and d bar, is irreducible. So by abuse of notation, I call this also uh, rho nd bar. In case it's irreducible, it's rho nd bar. In case it's not, it is this quotient. So it's always irreducible. So uh, the relation between monodromy and this is the following. By the way, this was not hard to prove, but uh, I couldn't find it anywhere. So I <laughs> yeah. So proposition. You know, we were looking at monodromy representation on H1 of a curve. So the monodromy representation is the direct sum of rho E of So uh, to repeat, if uh, E divides n, it is this uh, quotient which has dimension n minus 2. If E doesn't divide n, then it is the specialization of the Bureau representation. <clears throat> so if I want to prove uh, that the monodromy uh, group is arithmetic, we would be reduced to proving that so the monodromy group is a subgroup of a product of the form. I will keep writing the same h actually for each uh, uh, root of uh, e, for each divisor e of d, the Hermitian form sort of changes. But you know, I will just uh, assume this u h the ring of integers in the eth cyclotomic extension, E divides D. 
So it's a subgroup here. The monodromy group is a subgroup here. So, but uh, the thing is that I had assumed that n greater than or equal to 2d, uh, which is greater than or equal to 2 of e. So, in such a case, I, I can't justify this right now, but uh, uh, the signature of this Hermitian form, uh, sorry, this Hermitian form is isotropic even over, uh, over q. This Hermitian form represents a 0. In fact, it represents a, uh, the rank is at least 2 uh, in this case. So, just believe, take this for granted. So, it is what is called a higher rank group, it, because the rank of this uh, group over q is at least 2 in this case. So, uh, there is a lemma which says that if I have a subgroup, for example, if I have a subgroup of SL3z cross SL4z cross SL5z, let us see. So, that the projections have finite index, then the group has finite index in the product. No, no, no. The, 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 no, this is, you are right, this is just a generality. This is just a generality, but the fact that it represents a zero, you, then you, you know what the representation is, so you know some, you can produce vectors uh, which, uh, uh, which are isotropic vectors. And also the rank also. The rank also you can do, yes. Yeah, yeah. The rank also you can do. That, yeah, that's part of the thing. So it has higher rank. That's true. You do need the explicit form of the Bureau of Representation to do this higher rank. So, suppose I have a subgroup here, this is just an aside. If I have a subgroup here, which is like a, which is contained in a product like this, such that the projections uh, have finite index, then the product itself has finite index. This is not true if I took uh, SL2 or something, the rank 1 groups. It's only higher rank. And it's in fact a consequence of a, a famous theorem of Margulis, which says that if I have a normal subgroup in a higher rank group, uh, it has finite index or it's central and finite. So it, that's what gets used here. And one has to use this to say that it's enough to prove that the projection of gamma to one of these has finite index. So that's what uh, we will prove. What we will prove finally is that enough to show projection of gamma into the unitary group of O of D has finite index if uh, to show, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, if I want to prove that this has finite index here, that is if I want to prove arithmeticity, it is enough to prove arithmeticity in one of the factors. You see, uh, suppose I want to prove I have a subgroup here which is an arithmetic group which has finite index in this case. So, I am saying it is enough to prove that the projections have finite index. Somehow that is good enough. And uh, we are uh, reduced to proving uh, one of these proje projections has finite index if n greater than 2d. So, how is this to be proved? Uh, actually, I don't know too many criteria for proving that a group is arithmetic. There is a, a sort of one trick pony type of thing. Uh, so, the, the good thing about this, uh, uh, this inequality is that there are lots of unipotent elements. You have an isotropic group. So, what you do is to show that uh, the monodromy group also has plenty of unipotent elements. So, let me uh, prove this exactly in one case where n uh, is 2d plus 1. Proof of proof that the image of gamma of d is arithmetic, uh, has finite index. if n is 2d plus 1. So, that is what I want to sketch. So, that is where uh, this lemma really gets used. Uh, you see the point is that if I took for example n equal to 2d, 
the representation is not irreducible. It has a certain uh, degeneracy. And that degeneracy helps you find uh, unipotence. So what is the uh, thing? So I have the following situation. n is 2d plus 1. So I have the braid group on 2d plus 1 letters, which contains the braid group on 2d letters, which contains the braid group on 2d minus 1 letters. And also the way the Bureau representation is constructed, it's uh, easy to show that the Bureau for the smaller uh, index is a sub of the Bureau. Like this, there is a there is an inclusion that's sort of obvious actually, because you know we are looking at free group on n generators, free group on n minus one generators, and so on. It it's, uh, it's a functorial. <clears throat> so let's look at this first. Uh, the this lemma says that this representation is not irreducible; it's reducible. So the matrices uh, in this representation, the elements. of B2D in, in this representation or of the form there is a trivial copy I said and there is this uh, irreducible representation and there is some vector space stuff here. Right? But uh, so if I want to think of this as a sub of this, there is I had to add one more uh, one more vector here. So these matrices are actually to be thought of as this matrix rho two d d some vector space stuff here. So the matrices are of this type. Uh, if I look at the matrices coming from here. But you see, uh, what I said was that there is a theorem which says that if gamma has enough unipotent elements, then it has finite index. I'll say presently what that precise theorem is. But you know, uh, here it's not quite unipotent. You have a parabolic subgroup. You'd like to get unipotent. So uh, we would like to get rid of this uh, uh, Levy part. But the good thing about it is that there is an element here, which is a central element. And restricted to the smaller group, this quotient representation is irreducible. Yeah, yeah, sorry. This is a, this is a bar. Thanks. So this is a bar, but restricted to this subgroup, it is actually rho 2d minus 1, just that. Restricted to this subgroup, it's just the Bureau representation here. But you see, uh, that Bureau representation is irreducible. And so a central element, I will say what the central element is, it acts by scalars here. So if I take commutators, this part disappears and I get unipotent. And the thing is that uh, one has to check really that uh, that central element acts by a non-trivial scalar. You know, if it were a trivial scalar, you'll get nothing. But uh, so the central element is very pleasant actually. It's, uh, uh, it's called the Garside element which is like this. You take this and take the square. Uh, sorry, this is m. Minus 2. So if I take this element, which is called the Garside element, the action by this you can explicitly compute. The action here is q to the m plus 1. Not q to the m plus 1, sorry, q to the m. q to the m. So this is uh, primitive dth root of unity raised to the power of 2d minus 1. So it's non trivial. And that, that's really the trick. Because once you take commutators, you get one unipotent element, and by Using irreducibility, you get plenty of unipotent elements. You know, by conjugating by uh, by this Levy part, 
onto the unipotent part, you get lots of unipotent elements. Yeah, okay, I'm going to finish anyway. So the only, uh, uh, the only theorem that is, I just want to quote one theorem and stop. Uh, theorem. If G is, uh, sorry for the bad language, you know, absolutely almost simple <laughs> group and so on, is a Q simple group with real rank greater than or equal to 2, Q rank greater than or equal to 1, P in G, a parabolic Q subgroup, U, the unipotent radical, U minus the opposite The Lie algebra consists of negatives of the roots of U, opposite unipotent radical. Gamma is a subgroup of G of Z, and gamma intersection U plus minus Z has finite index. In U plus minus Z, implies gamma has finite index in G of Z. So this is the criterion. If I have a subgroup of uh, subgroup of G of Z which intersects the unipotent groups nicely, then it's uh, finite index. So this is not completely trivial. I mean, in fact, the full proof uses the uh, methods of the congruence subgroup problem. So, it, and this is very important, higher rank. For real rank one, it's false, so it's important. So once you have this theorem, and that's really what's getting used here, because uh, by this kind of trick, you can show that gamma intersects the unipotent radical uh, well. And uh, so all this works for n greater than or equal to 2d, but in fact, it also works for n greater than d. for n greater than d, except when d has factors e belonging to 3, 4, 6. Uh, there's no great mystery in this. The point is that the z mod e star here is uh, sort of trivial. It's just imaginary quadratic extension. So uh, there it doesn't work, but the good thing is that uh, if you look at the tables of Delin Mostov, uh, this is exactly the case where they prove arithmetic group, that the group is arithmetic. So you put this together, so you get the result for n greater than d as well. But in all this, you really need uh, the k is to be co prime to d. That is not, that's not a good assumption, but uh, um, to carry it through, you need some, some more. Uh, complicated version of this kind of theorem. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you. <clears throat>